Well, hi everyone. I thought I'd do an update to the story about the bridge fire underneath the Daniel Carter Bridge in Cincinnati, Ohio, commonly known as the Big Mac Bridge. I had a video that I posted a few days ago. This fire occurred in the early morning hours of Friday, November 1st. And so I thought I would include additional news that we've learned since this time and also address many of your comments that you left to my previous video. So as a reminder, we're talking about this playground that was on the southbound lanes and to the approach to the main span of the bridge. This is I-471 over the Ohio River going from Cincinnati to Northern Kentucky. This closure of the southbound lanes has had a huge ripple effect in terms of impacting traffic throughout the area. I'll go over some of those impacts, but in today's video, I wanna talk more about the reason why I believe this fire was so intense. Also, I wanna talk about how high temperatures impact structural steel members, such as the steel plate girders here that were damaged by this fire. I mean, this was an unbelievably intense fire. They, they being local officials, the DOT have reopened the northbound lanes, but the southbound lanes remain closed. And I'll go over what kind of time frame I think we're looking at here for this closure. But just a uh, tremendous amount of damage, very intense heat. The fire captain there indicated that he thought fire temperatures were on the order of several thousand degrees, which I believe. So here's an overview of the location of this bridge project, downtown Cincinnati. This bridge was constructed in 1976 at the cost of $14 million. I don't believe that's been adjusted for inflation. So you're looking at emergency repair costs for this bridge, probably in the tens of millions of dollars. So I'll include a link in the description to this video of the various news sources that I'm citing here. I came across this blog post for this thousand hands playground at Sawyer Point Park. This is the playground that caught fire and did all the damage to the bridge. And as has been reported by local reporters there, the playground consists of plastic materials, wooden materials. And now you can see in these photos, and as I surmised from my first video, that they've got cushioning, impact cushioning, for kids falling if they're playing on the playground there and it looks like a, a very thick rubberized mat. There was also this construction netting, and as I heard it described, I thought there might have been some work going on for the bridge, but looking at these photos, I suspect this is what they're talking about, and it looks like it's just netting to protect people in the playground from debris falling down from overhead, but this black netting caught on fire as well. But uh, yeah, here's a close-up of this Looks like rubberized material. And of course, it doesn't take much imagination to think that if an ignition source caused this rubber matting to catch fire, it would produce very high temperatures along with the plastic used for the playground set itself. And you can see this photo here, it was, there was still open flame the next day. So several hours after the fire had started. So as I touched on in my previous video, there tends to be some degree of complacency when you see these big open spaces underneath a bridge, people want to put it to, quote, good use. But uh, the downside is just too big, I think, in, in these situations, particularly where there's no protective fire coating on the exposed structural steel members. There's no fire suppression system. It's pretty uncommon to have, say, a sprinkler system for a bridge, but it can be implemented in certain cases. But you know, there's a tendency for people to see this open space and think, you know, we gotta put this to better use, especially for a bridge like this that's been around for 50 years nearly. And over time, people forget that the main purpose of the bridge is to carry now over 100,000 vehicles per day. I mean, it has a tremendous impact now, uh, this closure on, on people and going to and from work on a variety of businesses people trying to go to the hospital or what have you. It's, it's a big deal. Now let's get into the steel aspects of this. There's an excellent reference site here from the American Institute of Steel Construction, and they have some facts on uh, steel exposed to fire. This is one of the things I wanna to touch on here. The strength of steel remains essentially unchanged until about 600 degrees Fahrenheit. The steel retains about 50% of its strength at 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The steel loses all of its capacity when it melts at about 2700 degrees Fahrenheit. For design purposes, it is usually assumed that all capacity is lost around 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Also on the AISC website, there's this document that was published in 1998 that addresses the integrity of structural steel after exposure to fires. And that's what the beginning of that article looks like. And I'll have a link to this resource in the description to this video if you wanna check it out for yourself. But I wanna to touch on a few key things here. First of all, steel, structural steel in this case, has a crystalline structure. And the type of crystals that form have to do with how the steel was produced, under which temperatures, how it was cooled down, how rapidly it was cooled down, and so on. And also the percent carbon content. I've made knives as a hobby for many years and in order to get the steel workable, you have to get it up to 2,800 degrees, and that removes all the crystalline structure. The steel is no longer mag the steel is no longer magnetic at that point. And then you quench it. In my case, I use oil quench, and it causes the steel to form these crystalline structures. And, and then you've got a hardened steel uh, blade in this case. But for structural steel, in much the same way, if you lose that crystalline structure, you're gonna lose a lot of the strength. And we see the deformation of these structural steel members here. Now, why does this happen? This is a plot of steel yield strength versus temperature. And this simply illustrates what I stated before. As the temperature increases, the strength decreases. And you see we go to nearly zero at 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason this happens is that high temperatures cause the modulus of elasticity of the steel to go down. So the modulus of elasticity is merely the slope of a stress strain curve. So if you load a piece of steel to failure, and failure is defined as when deformations become excessive or unacceptably large, you can calculate the load at that point and compute the amount of, st of strain, which is the change of length relative to the original length of that steel member, and you come up with what's called the yield point, and that stress is called the yield stress. So the modulus of steel is 29,000 KSI, or 29 million pounds per square inch. So what happens is with increased temperature, you decrease the modulus for a given load, and stress is force, or a load divided by the area, if you decrease the modulus, you're gonna get more strain at a higher temperature than you would at a lower temperature for the steel. And this is exactly what we have in the case of the bridge. We have the steel plate girders supporting the bridge deck. There's a lot of weight associated with all the concrete and reinforcing steel for the bridge deck, and not even counting uh, passing traffic because obviously there was no traffic going over this bridge when it was on fire but you've got a very high load, just the, st the static load or the, the dead load of the bridge itself, the superstructure on the girders, the steel plate girders, which are also part of the superstructure. And the temperature increases, the load doesn't decrease, the modulus decreases, so now you start to get strain because the modulus has, has lowered to the point where that same load now produces a lot of change in the length of those steel members, so you get a lot of deformation and so on. I want to mention that Ohio DOT has been doing a good job updating people as to what they're doing. As an engineer, I'd like to know a lot more technical details uh, than have been released so far, but I think they, they will release those details in the coming days and weeks. But I'll include a link in the video to this I-471 uh, update center. Now, the DOT has announced that they've brought in Great Lakes construction to expedite the replacement of these damaged bridge spans. And just looking at their website, they're a heavy civil contractor, the type of contractor that you would want involved with an expedited repair like this. The other thing I thought that was interesting is the DOT is using these robotic dogs to inspect areas of the bridge. You know, that's a key aspect into expediting the repair of this bridge is first of all, find out what's damaged, what has to be replaced, and get a good handle on that before you go forward. So obviously these steel plate girders that are over this playground area have to be replaced. But as they were being heated up in this fire, they expanded. So they may have done damage to the girders and the connections at the adjacent 
bridge spans. I, I just don't know yet. That's something that they're going to have to determine here. Also, I don't know if there's been any damage to the reinforced concrete for the piers that support these steel plate girders for the bridge. They're going to have to take a hard look at that. Although it looks like, fortunately, the fire was near the midpoint of this span, so there may not have been much damage to the actual concrete piers themselves. But again, they're going to have to sort that out. As I mentioned, closure of these southbound lanes on I-471 has had a huge impact on traffic. I mean, look at this detour route. So I'll continue to provide updates as additional information emerges with this situation. I think you're still looking at an eight week time frame at best. I know there was a fire of another bridge in the area about four years ago, and they got that bridge up and running after six weeks, but I haven't looked at all the details to compare how similar those two situations are. But you know, you have to get the order in for the uh, steel plate girders to be produced. And usually you're t talking about an eight to 10 week lead time for that. Obviously they're gonna expedite that as much as they can. So road being closed for repairs for about two months and hopefully no longer. I'd also like to send a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support as well as those of you who've provided super thanks. That's another great way to support the channel. As I've done with several of my recent videos, I wanna talk about a book that I've recently read here. It's called The Disappearing Spoon by Sam Keen. And this is a newly discovered author for me. He's written a lot of great books and he apparently has a degree in physics as well as literature, and he's able to present really good technical information in a real easy style. I mean, his books read like novels, and I, I tend to burn through them very quickly. That's how engaging and, and easy it is to absorb the material. So this book is about the development of the periodic chart of the elements. He goes into various aspects of these elements. It's, it's very, very interesting. So if you're Wanting to check that out, I've got a link in the description. So thanks very much, everyone.